Welcome to the Genesis Volatility Podcast. I'm here with Ewan Sinclair. He's an author, a proprietary trader, and a doctorate in physics. Ewan, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. So Ewan, for anyone who doesn't know you yet, can you give us a brief background of your career and, and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, then I did my PhD in England. And I got to the end of my PhD, was looking around, didn't want to be an academic, trying to find something that would sort of use my skills. Um, and at the time, um, Bering's Bank was just about, just being blown up by Nick Leeson, which was the first I'd ever heard of derivatives, which is probably not a very auspicious start, but you know, that's the way everyone in England first heard of derivatives, I think. And so I got into that. I was working at a market making firm. Um, I've since worked as a quant risk manager, um, prop trader, had a hedge fund, did some fintech stuff. Cool. So starting with the beginning of your career in market making, you know, what is the hardest part of market making and what's kind of the easiest part of market making in your experience? Well, particularly with options, the hardest part is definitely risk management. Market makers are basically risk managers. Um, options are very slippery. They change, their prices change very quickly due to a number of inputs, you know, volatility, but also the underlying moves around, interest rates move around, there are correlations to other things. Things are moving very quickly. Your risk is multi-dimensional. You're exposed to a lot of these different things. Uh, so market making is largely about continually monitoring your risk and making offsetting trades. Uh, so kind of changing the way you're leaning to be more aggressive on the bid or the offer. Uh, the easiest part by far is making money because you just throw out bids and offers almost by definition if you get filled on a bid or lifted on an offer, it's, it's money at that point. It's very easy to make money, it's very hard to keep it. So market making is considerably more difficult than the people on Twitter who always blame market makers for everything bad that happens to them. And that's the other thing. People think market makers manipulate the markets. Nothing could be more wrong. Mm. I mean, in a field that's full of stupid people saying stupid stuff, that is the stupidest. Market makers have almost no capacity to move anything in the market. They're, they're kind of like driftwood. They're getting buffeted from all sides by incoming orders. They, they would love to manipulate things. I'm not saying they don't out of the goodness of their hearts, but they are they are far more at the mercy of external forces than a retail trader is. Yeah, that makes sense. That's like one of those situations where market makers envy the takers who get to choose when to participate in the markets right. and takers kind of blame that the market makers are not giving them a fair price and everyone's kind of complaining on some direction. Now, how much would you say a good market maker has good fits, good pricing, good theoretical values versus just being fast? I would, if I had to choose between the two of them, I would take being fast every day. Mm. Um, the ability to do the trade is much more important than the value you think the trade should be. There were honestly, back in the old days when the trading floors were a thing, there were guys who made money purely because they held up the right number of fingers. They knew that you were a good trader, you knew what you were doing, and you were three bid. So there you go, I'm three bid as well. And they would know that if they got filled on that price, that's that edge right there. Um, and so they really executions the entire thing. Market makers can trade without theoretical values because what you think something's worth is pretty much irrelevant. Mm. Um, like you might think something's worth 10, but if the market's five bit at six, as a market maker, you're five bit at six. Mm -hmm. Um, and so market makers, it's entirely an execution game. You know, and back then it was all about doing the arithmetic really quickly in your head. And now it's all about technology. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I read in your biography that you had automated some market making systems. So like, what did that mean? What does that mean? What was it like before? And what did you add in terms of automation? Okay, so this was back in 2000, 2001 when the ICE came on tap in the US. And before that, all the equity options were traded on the floor. Mm -hmm. And the floor basically, if you were an options trader there who traded stocks, you'd be in one pit and maybe three or four stock options would trade in that pit. So, you know, it might be 
Microsoft, Apple, two other things, say. When you had to trade electronically, you were given as a designated market maker responsibility to make markets in 50 stocks. Maybe five of those were actually busy, maybe five you could make some money, mm -hmm. but you had to still make markets in these other 45 things. So what I tried to do was, I didn't try and come up with anything new. I just literally tried to say, what is the process a market maker goes through when they do a trade? So how do I set my initial price? Well, you have to come up with an initial price because you're the only one doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't just mimic someone else. So at that point, it's a theoretical thing. So I set my initial price. Now, how do I adjust that value when someone trades with me? So if I get hit on the bid, I want to back up a little bit. How much I'll back up depends on the size of the trade. Because, you know, in microstructure, there are two viewpoints. There's inventory and there's information. But they're very highly correlated. You know, if, I, if I'm picking up inventory, it's because someone's selling stuff to me. Mm -hmm. So there's also, he's probably doing it on the basis of information. So either way, whether it's information or inventory, I know I have to move. And once I've moved that, all right, how do I move all the other prices? And that's where the pricing model comes in. That's where you need an idea of how the implied volatilities between different options are tied together. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And kind of following this trend, do you think that market making could be fully automated to the point where you don't even need humans? You could just, you know, someone could do the whole, the whole ladder across basically every single stock? Probably. I mean, because it used to be one trader would trade three or four stocks, and then you got to the, the ICE, and it was largely one trader would trade 50 stocks, you know, maybe five or six you'd be watching, mm -hmm. and the other 45, my little robot would be, you know, trundling away. Now you'll have two or three traders and they'll be trading 500 stocks. So that process is definitely going in that direction. And you know, it's always just a really bad bet to bet against automation. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a lot of people who are always like, yeah, you can automate that, but not my job. Mm -hmm. That's also been a really bad bet. It seems like eventually almost everything's going to be able to get automated, you know, yeah. computers and robots. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And we'll touch on crypto in a second, but we've seen a lot of automation in, tor in terms of spot market making, as well as AMMs that are coming online in the options market. So that's, that's kind of what's driving my question. One more point on automation of market makers. So, you know, if you're, if you want to hedge an option, you have to replicate it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of labor intensivity there. So is there a correlation that as market making gets automated and the cost of rep, you know, hedging options and, and offering these markets goes down, would the variance premium just naturally kind of go away if the labor component comes out of it? I don't think so, because I think the variance premium isn't there for that reason. I think there is a premium because of that, but I think that premium is really tied up in the bid-ask spread of the options initially. I think you could have perfectly fairly priced options with a bid-ask spread, and that would be enough to compensate for all these other mm. hedging costs. I think the variance premium, let's put it this way, the things we know in finance with the most historical data to back them up, stocks go up. We've got hundreds of years of evidence that stocks go up. People have studied it, taking everything into account, like different emerging markets, uh, bankruptcy, survivor bias, we know that. We know commodities go down because if they get to a certain price, people find something else they can use instead. Um, you know, the commodity itself becomes worthless after a while, like whale oil or mm -hmm. something like that, or Bitcoin. Um, the thing we know, I think, the next is that there's a variance premium. Um, there were books written in the 1890s which mentioned the variance premium. It's, I think, there for a very simple reason, that people want to buy insurance. So insurance, there's a premium for buying it. You know, and if an option's fairly priced, statistically, and I have the choice of owning it or being shorted, I'll own it every day of the week mm. because I want that upside. So I think um, just because of that, anything that's got a convex payoff, I think is always naturally, you're gonna to have to pay more than it's really actuarially worth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So 
after your market making experience, you had risk management experience, and then you went into the buy side. Can we just briefly touch on the difference in risk management from a buy side perspective? Hmm, I'm not sure I've ever really thought of that in terms of the risk management stuff. The actual difference, the big difference with the buy side is you've actually got to go out and find customers. Hmm. That's by far the hardest bit. Um, and then the other thing that's a real problem that you don't really consider is you're really stuck with the mandate. You have to kind of do what you tell people you'll do. And when you're talking to unsophisticated investors, they just want to know about your returns. Mm -hmm. The next level up is people want to know about the risk. Mm -hmm. But the really sophisticated people see you as a strategy they're going to put in their toolbox. Mm -hmm. And so they won't be happy if you lose money, but they'll be really unhappy if you start doing something you said you weren't going to do. Because then they, they're not getting what they paid for. So if I'm a short vol fund, even if I think I should be long vol, nope, you've got to be a short vol fund because that's what this guy's paying for you for. It's like with the, if you buy a healthcare ETF, right? If the manager thinks healthcare stocks suck, you don't want him suddenly selling them all and buying tech stocks. Mm -hmm. That's not what he's meant to be doing. So that was the really the hard bit is even when the market was in a situation you didn't want to be in, you kind of had to, you kind of had to stick there and, that was difficult because as a, if I'm a prop trader, my risk management is largely based on where I see edge. If I see edge somewhere, I want to stay in it and do more of it. If I don't see edge, I get out of it. With a hedge fund, you can't really do that. You have to sort of look, look for ways that are consistent with your mandate that reduce your risk. So I think it's one of the things as well, people from outside the industry think there's a lot more freedom to what most traders get to do than they really, really have. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, actually that brings us to prop trading. So prop trading is one of the, the most interesting segments, I think, because you can do what's gonna make money and you don't necessarily have this, this mandate that you have to always follow the strategy. What got you into vol trading as opposed to Delta One products? Do you think that there's more edge in volatility trading? Okay, so that's a difficult question. I think I fell into the trap a lot of people do. When I left school, I worked for an options trading firm. So there's a lot to learn about options when you're trading them. It's not like, if I tell you a stock, all you've got to know is the price of the stock went up and went down. Options are way more complicated. So you spend all this time learning all this stuff and you get stuck in a mindset. Whenever you have an idea, you think, what option can I trade to express this? And often it's not the right thing to do. But as an options trader, you run towards the option space and it's a real trap. You've got, to, you've got to remember you're a trader first. And sometimes options are the way to go, but sometimes they're not. And I mean, all of this stuff that I confidently tell other people, I fall into these traps all the time. I'm certainly not saying I'm a great trader, you know, or even particularly good trader. I've been in the game for a while, so I've survived. I can do it, but I'm not saying this stuff's easy. It is definitely a trap. Um, in terms of the edge, the variance premium is always there for you. Um, it comes and goes in terms of magnitude, but it's something, it's like gravity, right? It's there, it's a force. It's not always a way to make money. Sometimes you want to take the other side, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's something that you kind of can rely on. Um, the problem with options is that you can be right and still lose money. And I don't mean statistically on average, right? I don't mean like, it's like you've got a 55% heads coin. 45% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the time you're gonna lose money. But that's because you called that individual flip wrong. Mm -hmm. With options and volatility trading, let's say you think vol is gonna be 10, the implied's 20, you sell it, vol is 10, you can still lose money. Mm -hmm. So. I kind of think philosophically that's a good thing because it's like the casinos, right? They're always showing the pictures of the winners mm -hmm. because they want people to keep coming back. And the more confusion people have about the relationship between their thesis and their results, it's probably good for me because that means that the people are going to still keep doing things that are wrong, lead to places that I can profit. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And 
when you think about some of your trades, I mean, obviously we've touched on a variance premium. What about like relative vol trading, implied correlation? Also, do you ever trade with a delta bias? Okay. Um, I typically don't do relative vol trading. Um, I'm not saying it's not a good thing. It's just something I typically don't do. Um, occasionally I will. Like, Sometimes there'll be dislocations in the options of various leveraged ETFs. Um, obviously there is a relationship between all the options on say a negative two leveraged ETF and a positive two one, mm -hmm. but that's sometimes not very efficiently priced into the market. It's an extra level of theory that a lot of people don't go through. And so sometimes you'll find the edge there, uh, but generally I don't do it. Generally, I want my longs and my shorts both on their own to have edge. Um, I do take directional bias. Whether I should or not, the markets, I mean, I'm sort of undecided on that. I mean, I do P&L everything separately. Mm -hmm. um, it has made money. Whether it's worth the amount of effort I've put into doing it is really the issue. Um, it's just a lot harder to predict direction. Interesting. Yeah, okay, I can see that. And you know, just a couple more questions on your trading because I know a lot of people would love to know more about it. Um, how much of your trading is you coding something and walking away from the machine or you having an idea and basically clicking buttons and making your trade? My option stuff isn't automated at all. Um, people always say, well, you should automate it. For me to automate it, would probably take, for me to automate, would probably take two or three weeks. For someone who was really good at programming to the API, maybe three or four days. In either case, it only takes me about 10 minutes a day to put my orders in. It's just really not worth it. And I kind of like to be manually engaged to a certain degree, because I think you learn in that process. It's like a lot of my record keeping, I still do with Excel and I don't pull data in. I actually type a lot of stuff in by hand because by doing that, it forces you to look at it. It's like an active learning thing rather than just coming in, turning the machine on eight hours later, looking at your PL. That might make you money, but it certainly isn't going to teach you anything at the same time. And I think that's, I think that's dangerous. I think you should do as much as possible manually, which is completely against what most people think. Hmm. Um, and if you've got an operation, sometimes you can't, right? I'm not saying always, but I'm saying as much as possible. You do learn from that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's, you know, when I read a book and I'm taking notes, I do it by hand as opposed to typing it on the computer. There's a level there of connection that feels like it's making more traces in my brain of actually learning something. Yeah, it's like when you, something actually Richard Feynman wrote about it. When you're reading a research paper, one of the best things you can do is go through it yourself manually and change all the notation. Because just by doing that, it forces you to really be active in the engagement of it. It makes a big difference. Yeah, totally. So kind of moving on to sources of edge, I think this is such an interesting trading topic. So one of the places that I like to think of sources of edge, and I've, I've, I've seen this in options, is that the obvious trade is typically the one that you want to fade. You know, it falls low, the obvious trade is to buy vol. The better trade is to sell vol when it's low. When vol is high, it's almost the best time to buy vol. And we see that in, in the crypto space and, and in the equity space. Is that kind of how you think about edge? You know, who is obviously in this trade and where are their pain points? Is that a, a way to think about it? I try to think about it that way. I'm not very good at thinking about it that way. Your example of vol is perfectly sensible, but the way I came to that conclusion is just by looking at the numbers. Mm. I'm not very good at sort of figuring out the mistakes other people are obviously making. And it's a skill I would love, and it's a real skill. Um, although I would say it's dangerous in that it's one of those things a lot more people think they can do than really can do. Mm -hmm. Whereas my way of just putting numbers into Python or Excel, I know I can do that. There's no doubt that that is what it is. Um, but your method, yeah, I know a couple of really good traders who basically, basically fade, you know, the dumb money. Mm. Um, and if 
like my equity options thing that I'm doing now has been, I don't know, depending on when you say I started it, 10 years in the making. And it really recently has come down to something really simple, just fade Wall Street bets, mm -hmm. just sell vol on every meme stock. You know, and I'm sure there are guys out there who've done that. They just came to that conclusion just by reading Wall Street bets and saying these guys are all stupid, mm -hmm. which works too. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, because we know that they're, they're kind of fear of messing out, probably overpaying, and yeah. therefore taking the other side of an overpaid trade. Makes, well, makes also, if you're trading against someone and they're doing the trade for a different reason, there's often edge there. Mm -hmm. So if someone's buying calls because they think the stock's going to go up and the kind of volatility and different, they just want to do it, often that's a really good chance to sell. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you touched on some of the data, like you come to these conclusions from data. In your experience, what are some pain points with working with data and some, some things that you like to see when you're working with data? So for example, you know, a lot of times at GVOL, I, I find myself cleaning data. Do you, do you have to go through that process? You know, what is the, the scrubbing of data and, and making sure it looks good? It's awful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the things people don't realize about trading. They think you sit around thinking deep thoughts. You really spend a lot of time doing stuff like that. Like recently I had an idea and I didn't do it in the end, but it was an idea of trading Coinbase against Bitcoin. Okay, because they were the stock Coinbase was very correlated to Bitcoin. You could just look at it on a graph; it was the same. So I was like, okay, so I'll, tr I'll test that. Well, Coinbase is only open, you know, during equity market hours. Bitcoin's open twenty four hours a day. So you've got to align all of that data and make sure all the timestamps line up. That was just a really tedious, horrible thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and if there was one kind of data that was always the same kind of messed up then it would be easy, it would just be a one-off thing. But by definition, you're cleaning up, you know, something that's just almost always idiosyncratically awful. Yeah, um, yeah. It's really important. I mean, just pulling in data and then just running a regression on it, you'll find yourself, you know, with that kind of thing, you'll find yourself using asynchronous data and essentially, you know, predicting the past. Mm. So you touched on your, your trading, you're looking at Coinbase versus Bitcoin. In your core strategy, you know, what is the main asset you trade and, and how much into crypto have you started looking? Um, I have been involved in crypto volatility stuff for a while, um, but I personally haven't been trading it, but I've been in that space talking to people who have, and I've been looking at it. Um, I've done very little in the underlying stuff. Um, I haven't done any sort of, you know, any of the MEV trades or the high frequency kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been, I have been looking at the options. It's one of those things where you think, well, great, this is a really fragmented market. There must be opportunities. That also means. The reason the opportunities are there is because they're hard to exploit. You know, you need you need to be looking at a whole bunch of various different you know markets, and none of them are. You know, there's this thing that DeFi, all the DeFi zealots are like. You know, we're decentralizing everything. Isn't that great? Well, the answer is no. I mean, the, the idea of having a centralized exchange was a really good one. Mm. You know, going back to when stock markets first started and people would go to the town square, that was great. You know where to buy and sell. It's one place. You don't have everyone trading there except for one guy who's trading around the back of a pub. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a terrible thing. And that's sort of where DeFi is now. You've got so many different places to trade options and volatility related products like you know the yield farms and so forth so just keeping them keeping them all together and managing them all in one place and getting price feeds and stuff is just a huge amount of work yeah definitely a ton ton of work so we chatted before about this and this is something i'd like for you to touch on you said something to the gist of these tra the trading strategies that work in crypto are things that we figured out in traditional finance a while ago and are now being applied to crypto more or less if i, if I got that right so the way that I think about that is that we almost have like an inverse um, participation in the crypto market. 
traditional fiduciaries couldn't really participate. You can't just go ahead and buy digital money with, with your fund, it's against your mandate. Only the retail people could sort of do that. And now we're getting sort of like a, a more sophisticated investor class into the crypto space. So these strategies that we'd see in traditional finance seem to, to work in crypto, at least for a short amount of time until they get exploited out. Is there things that for you stick out? Things like seasonality or things like, um, I don't know, maybe like uh, relative valuations or relative vol stuff that you see in the crypto space without giving secrets that you don't want to give out? Well, okay, so that's one thing that I'm a big believer that almost there's very few secrets, real secrets. Almost everything comes down to how you implement it. Um, like you can write books. I literally have written books telling you how to trade options. Mm -hmm. But most of the stuff comes down to doing things like cleaning data getting data feeds hooked up, uh, combining these positions from different places. It's, you get paid for work. You don't get paid for thinking. Mm. Knowledge is meaningless. It's the ability to put that knowledge into practice is what gets you paid. So I'm not really too worried about giving away secrets. Um, there are a couple of things in crypto that, well, for a start, everything that exists in crypto exists to a certain degree everywhere else, mm -hmm. right? None of these markets are absolutely unique. Mm -hmm. But crypto does display much more obvious seasonality patterns than most other financial instruments. Um, like some TradFi instruments, like the VIX, for example, has definite seasonal patterns but they are much smaller in degree than you'd see in crypto. Like crypto, if you just look at Bitcoin, you look at its performance on various days of the week. Um, like it goes up on Mondays or something. Hmm. I mean, that's just very obvious and it's statistically significant. Whereas most of these things in TradFi are there, but they're right on the edge of significance. Hmm. Um, so you see stuff like that in crypto and you can look as well like patterns in volatility similar to that um, but the other thing I've noticed in crypto is the way volatility is serially correlated it seems to have much less of a memory than it does in say equities the volatility structure in most markets is such that the best guess of tomorrow's volatility is whatever it was today I mean it's not going to be exactly true but that's a very very difficult benchmark to beat um, so if the S&P moved 3% yesterday, it's going to move very close to 3% today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Crypto is not like that. If you look at the move contracts on FTX, which is just a bet on how much the Bitcoin is going to move in the next day, you might see it be priced at 6% one day. And in equity world, the next day would be close to 6% as well. But Bitcoin, it could be 2%. It seems to have a very, very short memory. Um, and it seems to be more driven by those calendar effects we were talking about than by the classic sort of Garch-like volatility effects. And with something like that, I'm not too interested in figuring out why. Mm. Um, I mean, you're, any statistical model you can fit to it, but it's just kind of interesting. I'm not really sure, but it is a difference. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Another kind of open question I always think about is that you know, there's 365 trading days for crypto, but obviously weekends don't have the same magnitude of trading right. as the rest of the week. So, you know, is, is 365 the right number to annualize your haul? Is it 252? Is it something in between? I, I think there's, there might be something to look at there as well. I like to keep those effects separate. Mm. Like in the Black-Scholes equation, leaving aside carry terms, Every, every time volatility turns up, it turns up with the square root of time. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't a thing called time. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a thing called volatility. It's the same thing. It's volatility time. So you can take that effect into account by tweaking either parameter. But I'd prefer to say, you know, because it's true, there are 365 days. I'd rather stick with that known fact and then tweak the vol part. Um, so it's definitely true the weekends are quieter. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would do that by tweaking vol. One of the other things, it's a little, maybe a little more technical, but the stickiness of the actual implied vol curve seems to be stronger for Bitcoin than it does in most other markets. Hmm. Um, 
I noticed uh, there's a quant slash academic called Arta Sepp who does a lot of good stuff like this on volatility moves and he recently published a paper showing that for for Ethereum, I think. That's interesting. Could you go into a little bit more detail of like what that means or wh where that opportunity would be if there was one, if there's more stickiness in, in Bitcoin or crypto versus... Well, what that would mean is that the volatility of say the Ethereum 1200 strike, it tends to stay the same even if the coin moves from 1000 down to 900. So it's like the curve doesn't float along with it, right. it just stays there. It's like a sticky strike. Yeah. Now sometimes nothing's ever perfectly sticky. Mm -hmm. um, so you never get perfectly sticky delta or perfectly sticky strike. Sometimes there are arbitrage relationships if you know exactly what things are going to move like. But more often, if you think you found an arb, the it's not quite there. It's normally something to sort of be cognizant of. I don't really know if you can really trade it just on its own. Yeah. Especially the crypto markets are still pretty wide. That's interesting. There's a couple of things that I've seen in the crypto space and looking at the data. I wonder if you have any takes on this. One of them was, you know, a lot of people hedge with the perpetual um, and the futures have a big cash and carry to them sometimes. And that, that sort of implied interest rate into the future or the perpetual is correlated to the spot prices. So when, when crypto is rallying, everyone wants to get long and they have this fear of missing out and they want to get leveraged long. And then they start bidding up the future versus the spot. And then when pr prices crash, you have this correlation the other way or same correlation, but it moves the other way. And that interest rate goes from say 20% to maybe negative. And so I wonder if there's something there into the vol space, you know, how does that affect the options and is there a... Okay, technically that's going to be a really difficult question. Um, okay, in the equity world, think of it this way. We know that there is correlation between how volatility moves and how the spot moves. Mm -hmm. And that basically is the reason you get the implied curve. The implied curve's got very little to do with the actual distribution of the underlying. It's mainly a statement about how at the money vol moves as the spot moves. And we've got models that try and account for that, you know, stochastic vol models and stuff like that. None of them are particularly good, but that's the problem they're trying to address. What you've just told me, which is true, I had never thought about it before, would be another layer of a similar thing like that. You'd have to have a built-in correlation between carry rates mm -hmm. and spot price. That is going to be at least as difficult as the volatility problem and solving the both together, I mean, forget about it. It's not gonna, you're not going to be able to do it. So I would think it's one of those things where you're really just going to have to have some sort of ad hoc model to mm. do. Like, we, like most traders don't use stochastic vol models, right? The only reason you would use that is if you needed to be able to price exotics consistently with vanillas. Mm. I mean, market makers don't use that stuff. They basically have a curve. As things change, they tweak their curve. So it's like black shoals continually updated. So for your problem, you'd in practice do the same thing. Um, I haven't thought about how that would actually, how you could profit from that. Usually interest rate effects are so small that you can kind of forget about them. But in crypto world, that needn't be the case. They're huge. Well, right now they're not, right? But certainly at the start of last year, they were ridiculous. Yeah, in, in uh, 2021, Q2 2021, the cash and carry is 46% annualized. That means you could just buy Bitcoin, deposit it at Deribit or whatever exchange, sell the future against, against it, take zero delta risk, and capture 46%. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, to be honest, if I can make 46% with a cash and carry ARB, I'm not going to bother with options. Right. I mean, it's pretty hard to beat that for, I mean, it was an essentially a risk-free trade. Yes. Apart from a bit of execution risk, but again, 46%, you know, maybe you execute badly and get 40. Exactly. I mean, some people would argue, okay, well, there's, you know, counterparty risk with the exchange and stuff like that, but that's not a constant 46%. That's moving because of the market. Right, and you've got counterparty risk with the options as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's actually kind of a, another problem with 
crypto vol trading. You know, if you make 80% per year on your vol book on, in Bitcoin, but then Bitcoin does a thousand percent of returns, you don't feel very good about your performance and probably your LPs or whatever are not, not thrilled either. I think that can potentially be a source of, you know, edge that exists in the crypto vol space that people are not capturing because there's more money to be made elsewhere. Do you think that's a plausible? Yeah, I haven't thought of it in those terms exactly, but yeah, it's the issue is sort of people are trading Bitcoin, but no one's currency of determination is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So if I'm trading, I don't know, Apple options denominated in dollars, right? Well, let's say I make 30% a year. I don't then say, ah, but the dollar against the euro has done this. I just don't care mm -hmm. because I can take that money and go and spend it. Whereas Bitcoin, let's be honest, and I know you're more of a believer than I am, but Bitcoin's not a currency. I mean, you can't spend it anywhere, right? And I know there's going to be some people who are going, oh yeah, but you can, you can, you know, spend it in this one place I found. Well, it, it's not really, no one's currency of determination is Bitcoin. So you've always got that effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other problem with Bitcoin as a currency, and it feeds into what you just said, is it's so much more volatile than the stuff you might want to buy with it. Right, right. So actually, so I'm not necessarily a Bitcoin maxi, I'm more of an Ethereum maxi, but jumping on to the crypto side of things. That's like saying you're not a fundamentalist Christian, you're a fundamentalist Muslim. I mean, it's still, it's, you're still a religious zealot. Well, actually, let's talk about what your cri cryptocurrency of choice is. So I know that you do stuff in Ethereum. Yeah. I know that you've looked at Solana and mm -hmm. obviously you've looked at Bitcoin. So which one are, which maxi are you? That's difficult, right? It's sort of like saying, do you want to drown or die in a fire? Um, Ethereum's big problem is gas. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's expensive to trade small sizes in Ethereum. Um, Solana's big problem is half the time it doesn't work, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a problem because you want instant liquidity generally. So I don't know, of those two, I mean, if you're big enough, the gas isn't such an issue. So of those, I'd probably go with ETH. But again, eh, you know, I don't think Bitcoin really has you can't put them at Bitcoin in the same category as those two. Bitcoin just doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not having a programmable blockchain is a much bigger deal. Yeah, right. I remember when I first invested in Ethereum, I was convinced that Ethereum would flip the market cap of Bitcoin. And I learned the hard way that first mover advantage means something in the market. And so I'm still kind of thinking at some point, Ethereum is the more valuable value prop. But I think it almost has to be right because it it has all the stuff that, is, that Bitcoin has going for it, and it has extra stuff. So it's got this kind of compound optionality on top of it. So it seems like it has to. And I know there will be some Bitcoin maximalists who'll say, oh, but it's a limited supply. And at that point, you know, it's like land that has to keep going up. But my argument to that would be, it could now go to zero because it's a limited supply and you can't do anything with it. Hmm. So. At a certain point, you really want to be able to sort of spend your currency on something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum also has these properties where, you know, programmable blockchain, there's a lot of development on Ethereum. So we have the DeFi space, we have these NFTs. We've talked about this before, but it's almost like buying Ethereum is, you know, the index fund on all that stuff. Do you, do you see yourself, you know, investing in Ethereum in the long term? Is that something that you would do or is that too much out of your purview as a trader? Um, for my long term investment uh, portfolio, I have invested in Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's like an asset. It's to me, it's just like any other asset. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things in my portfolio I think are garbage, but they're still in there because they're assets that have certain correlations and certain predicted returns and all this kind of stuff. So I think really it's silly. And I know the crypto market is only worth a quarter of what it was a month ago, mm -hmm. but it's still a very big thing now. You should, I think everyone should have some of it in their portfolio. I see. So at least from a diversification perspective, it's worth owning some. Yeah, and to your other point about it being kind of the 
the benchmark. I'm playing around with some sort of stat arb type stuff mm. in the crypto space, right? And with stocks, the typical correlation between stocks and unrelated industries might be 30 to 50 percent. With most crypto stuff, it's way high across correlations. So you can actually treat Ethereum as like a basis and use that, sort of subtract that out and do everything relative to that. So it does seem to behave the way you say it does. That's very interesting. So basically you could buy some tokens, sell ETH against it, get some relative value like that. Yeah, you kind of treat it as like the exposure to the first um, PCA factor kind of thing. Interesting. Now, a lot of the edge that I've seen in crypto over, so I started investing in crypto in 2014, 2013. There's a lot of cycles. There's an there's a ICO cycle, then there's this airdrop cycle, then there's this yield farming cycle. I know that you've looked at things like yield farming and you know providing liquidity on Uniswap. Are there other types of things that that you like in the crypto space that you think are these interesting opportunities? I mean, you touched on stat art, but do, um, you do ICOs and airdrops and things like that. ICOs are kind of outside anything I've ever done. I mean, this, to me, this is a lot like the dot-com bubble and crash. It's just happening quicker. Mm. You know, it's up until very recently, I would have said the blockchain is like the internet was in 1995. It's there. We all think it's going to be big, but there's no eBay. There's no Amazon. There's no Google. No one really knows what it's going to do yet. Um, and I think we've slightly got past that now. Now it's sort of almost treated like a lot of these tokens are essentially like companies funding startups through tokens instead of stock floats, right? That seems to be where that's taken off to. And that's a valuable thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's important. On the other hand, I don't have any way of valuing any of these things myself. Um, and I do think we've seen a lot of the same behavior that happened in 2000 to 2003 in the crash, but it happened in about a week and a half in crypto. Mm. And the world always gets faster, right? Like things that used to take months in say post earnings announcement drift now takes weeks. That's sort of the way the world works. But crypto, crypto seems to change very quickly just in terms of the sociology of it. Like what's big this week, what isn't. It wouldn't surprise me if NFTs just went away and no one ever talked about them again. Hmm. You know, like we were talking about SPACs about a year ago. Hmm. No one talks about SPACs anymore. Yeah, interesting. So I, I, I've heard this theory from one of my trader friends in, in the crypto space, and he says, you know, what, and this is to your point on NFTs, he says, what's the biggest, you know, the richest person in the world? Elon Musk, you know, Tesla, all that stuff. Second richest person is Bezos, Amazon, all that stuff. Third richest person is the guy who does all these luxury brands. And his point is that brands and identity and sort of uh, this this asset that's only like a, a, I don't know, just like a reputation thing is worth a, a lot of money and it ends up being sort of, you know, people buy Rolexes for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, is our NFTs sort of that version in the, blockchain space and kind of one last point there is I do think NFTs have this kind of uh, liquidity premium that can be harvested so I think if you put on a bunch of bids off market in quality NFTs and crypto markets crash someone will pay down 30% below you know what the last traded price is or whatever it is and basically because there's no liquidity you can kind of harvest that yeah, it, look, NFTs at their best are a new medium for art. Mm. You know, and it, we've seen this before, you know, in the, I don't know, early 20th century, then lithographs came along and it became a new thing. And so the artists like Monet used to just paint pictures, but Picasso would paint pictures. He'd also do lithographs. So, you know, they'd be available in editions of 100 or something. And so at the time, people are like, well, that's not a real Picasso. But now we think it is. Mm. Now we look back and we go, well, that's a real Picasso. So a lot of the NFTs, right, it's like, that's sort of how we're going to see them. We're going to be like, well, the, you know, the bored ape, how many bored apes are there? 
but you know, how many Picasso lithographs are there? So mm -hmm. the very best of the NFT, I think we're in a bubble, but the very best of the NFTs I could see still being worth something. Um, I think it's some artists, there are already some artists who are only grew up in the NFT world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think other, I could see Banksy really getting into this because it's the sort of thing he would do. He'd yeah. do it as a joke and make fun of it, but that's a very Banksy thing. Mm -hmm. And Damien Hirst did it. It's a very Damien Hirst thing to do as well. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, as a form of art, you know, I could see it being... The problem with it, though, is you can't hang it on the wall. You know, that's... With your Picasso, you can stick it on the wall and impress people. Mm -hmm. well, you could put it as a Twitter profile and impress people. That's the counter argument. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure some of the big art collectors. I'm sure Steve Cohen's got a ton of NFTs because mm -hmm. it just. It would surprise me if he didn't. Awesome. Cool. A couple last questions to close up here on a more personal note. What is uh, your favorite book that you've written, and what is your favorite book that you've read? Ooh. Um. Well, my most well-known book's Volatility Trading, and I think it's by far the worst book I've written. Um, it was the first book I've written, and looking back as a piece of writing, it's very loose. It's just not as... You get better as you do things. And it was the first piece of real writing I've done. Um, I think my book Options Trading, which I intended to be a replacement for Natenberg. Mm. And I'm pretty honest about what I'm good at and what I'm bad at. That book is way better than Natenberg. Mm. But it also tells me back the first mover advantage. Every trader says, you should read Natenberg, you should read Natenberg. And that's just the way it is. It's like the Bible. It gets recommended and no one ever actually reads it. Um, so I think that's probably my best book. Mm. Best book I've read, I assume you mean about the markets. Because um, I would say the best book I've read is Gravity's Rainbow. Okay. Which is almost something you have to read as a piece of art because it makes practically no sense if you try and do it otherwise. About the markets, um, you know, Nassim Taleb, who I disagree with about a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the best book, but I think it's the most important book for my career, was his first book, Dynamic Hedging which I know a bunch of people have recommended, and I honestly don't see it as particularly useful for most options traders, because it's very much designed for institutional traders, and it's 30 years out of date. Mm -hmm. But at the time when it came out in the late 90s, it was a big deal, and it made a lot of sense to me, and it really helped me build a framework for thinking and I think that's the most important thing when you're reading a book to try and learn isn't the facts it teaches you, it's the way to think about the subject. Mm. So that I would say is the most significant book in my career. That's really interesting. Yeah, and like you mentioned, we've been hearing that a lot on the podcast, that, that book being recommended. Cool. Two, two last questions just for fun. Okay. Last question uh, on the personal side. What's your favorite Chicago neighborhood? Oh, well... I mean, I live in Bucktown, mm -hmm. so I lived there for 12 years. I like Bucktown. It's, look, I don't want to be one of these people who gentrify the neighborhood and then complain that it's been gentrified, but it's not as quirky as it was. Mm. Um, some of the old bars and venues have closed down, which is a shame, mm. but that's sort of the way of things. We also have a lot less graffiti and a lot less gang violence, mm. so that helps. So I'd go with Bucktown. Although people think it's got good restaurants, it really hasn't got any restaurants. So there's a bit of a misconception about what it's really like, but it's very green and leafy and we've got a nice street. Yeah, it's one, Wicker Park, definitely one of my favorite neighborhoods in the world, I would say. And then what do you do for fun? I mean, you're obviously trading all the time. You're a married man. I mean, where, where do you have uh, time to do things outside of work and what do you do? I like the fact you've put fun as something apart or outside of marriage. So obviously you <laughs> no, work a lot and you're married, so what do you actually do that's fun? Um, we had a, a, uh, a housekeeper once who said, well, you don't really do much for fun. And then she said, well, you don't really seem to do much at all. <laughs> so, I don't know, I spend a lot of time reading. Um, I like driving and um, I do play golf, although I wouldn't say I really only play so I can beat my father-in-law. Mm. I don't really like golf, but I do find myself playing. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, you and thank you so much. Everyone who's kept come to the podcast, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Absolutely.